Stanford University. Good evening, everybody. Great to see you again. We've had, uh, it looks like a temporary reprieve in precipitation. Uh, this morning, uh, when I was, I was saying to Charlie, I was out um, running about 5.30 in the morning on my sort of second loop of campus drive, and I've done this virtually every day for the nine years I've been here, and it was a surrealistic moment because I was out concentrating, listening to my unabridged books on tape, Wolf Hall, if you are interested, that's a great book. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, like an explosion, all the lights on campus went out. And uh, it was surrealistic. And part of me said, just keep going. <laughs> and then a voice in my ear said, not a good idea. Better go back. Um, so that's why I'm here tonight. I did not get struck by lightning. So I'm no more enlightened than I was uh, yesterday. Well, we're um, very pleased to see you this evening. Um, and I'm very pleased that tonight's speaker, uh, as I am, has his background in pediatrics. Uh, and tonight's topic is not really just about a pediatric issue. It really comes to the heart, pun intended, of a uh, important issue in developmental biology. So if you think about it, when we in the first semester, uh, first quarter rather, talked about uh, stem cell biology and how cells and organs develop normally, which is really quite astounding when you think about it happens, it's important to recognize uh, that from time to time that doesn't go properly. And as it turns out, one of the major causes of morbidity and indeed mortality in infants and children is related to congenital or acquired malformations. And of those, among the most common, important, and immediately life-threatening are those that affect the heart. So thinking about and learning why things go awry uh, is an important segue to understanding some of the incredible technologies uh, that have helped to shape new therapies and interventions, both uh, surgical, interventional, and medical, and that have also helped to reveal important clues about this whole mystery uh, of developmental biology. So I'm very pleased tonight that our speaker is Dan Bernstein, who I've had the privilege of knowing for uh, many uh, years. Um, Dan uh, is, um, uh, had his background um, training at MIT uh, and then went on to New York University School of Medicine and then began his pediatrics at Montefiore Hospital. Now, for those who may not know this, but I know at Montefiore at the time Dan was there was a social hotbed um, of radicalism uh, in uh, medicine and pediatrics. If they'd only listened uh, to the people at Montefiore, then we would have had health care reform a long time ago. Um, but the fact is, um, Dan started out on that pathway uh, and then uh, decided that he wanted to learn more about important specialties in pediatrics and went on to do his training in pediatric cardiology uh, at UCSF um, and began his career both as a pediatric oncologist and as an investigator focusing on some of the molecular and cellular biological issues that relate um, to heart uh, development. Uh, he uh, has been a member of the Stanford community for what will soon be a quarter of a century um, and uh, a great milestone. And he's had a very distinguished career, not only here, um, but also nationally. He uh, has been the past president of the Society of Pediatric Research, uh, really one of the most important um, national societies in pediatrics, and I think uh, in a very important way helped to shape um, the leadership and the important emphasis uh, both at Stanford and at Packer Children's Hospital in what has become one of its most important areas of clinical and investigative work, and that's the Heart Center, uh, which he played a critically important role in recruiting amazing talent to and in helping to lead uh, in his role uh, as director of cardiology. So with um, uh, great um, pride, uh, I'm very happy to introduce Dan Bernstein uh, to you this evening. 
Well, thanks for that wonderful introduction, Phil. And it's certainly been a real pleasure both working with you these uh, last uh, many years as well as uh, participating in this course. And I thank you all for braving, braving the elements and the flashes of lightning and other things in coming out tonight. I, I know this is definitely not a medical school lecture because I walked in here at about five after six and the room was already half full. Um, <clears throat> If this was a medical school lecture, that would have happened at around five after seven. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> let's hope that my computer behaves itself. And can, can everybody hear me? Is this mic on? OK. Uh, oh, the recording business. OK, because I sometimes tend to wander a little. I'll have to not do that. Um, so uh, when people talk about, and maybe can, is it possible? I guess I don't know if we can have the lights down. Can you guys see the slides OK? And then the other important thing is this lecture, like every lecture I give, is made to be interrupted. So you're perfectly welcome to ask questions at any time. Um, sometimes I may say I'm going to cover that later, so hold your question. Uh, but we have lots of time, and I hope this can be a dialogue as well as a lecture. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of people want to know why, why heart disease in kids. Um, come on, kids don't have heart problems. And to illustrate that, when I talk to our new medical students, I like to use this um, wonderful illustration by one of my uh, also alumni from NYU, a guy named Frank Netter, who basically revolutionized uh, medical illustration. And this illustrates to me the typical adult patient with a heart problem. This gentleman uh, has just had dinner at his favorite restaurant, and he started out with a huge steak, and he didn't trim the fat around the edges. <laughs> and then he had butter and cream cheese and bacon on that baked potato, um, and he had a big slab of, of cheesecake for dessert, but he had sweet and low in his coffee because he read somewhere in the newspaper that watching your calories and diet had something to do with heart disease. So he's, he's um, leaving the restaurant here, and as you can see, as he clutches his chest in pain, he's dropped that cigarette from his clenched teeth. <laughs> this is one of my patients. Um, he's a lot cuter. Um, <clears throat> a lot more adorable, easier to, to get along with. Um, there are some important differences between these two patients. Um, this little guy didn't have anything to do with his heart disease. He was born with it. It wasn't that he drank and ate and didn't exercise and you know, he wasn't doing push-ups in the womb. Um, he basically, unfortunately, was born with a, with a heart problem. And that in lies one of the major differences between adults with heart disease and children, and that is most adult heart disease, but not all, is related to choices in our lifestyles. Um, now we, over the last 20 years, we now recognize there's a big genetic component to that, and that some of us are programmed that if we eat you know, three steaks a day, we're never gonna wind up with heart disease, and the rest of us, uh, you know, like that runner, Jim Fix, uh, will go out like, like, like Phil and jog you know, like two hours a day and still wind up dying uh, in his late 30s uh, from heart disease because his genes, <laughs> hopefully not dying. But his genes have said you're at, a, at higher risk. Um, and, and this little guy, again, he hasn't been around long enough to, to play a role in his heart disease, but uh, for reasons that we'll explore tonight, um, he was born with a major heart problem. But there's another major difference between adults and kids, um, and this is a little bit less of a clear difference. Most adults with heart disease um, tend to have problems related to hardening of the arteries. They tend to have problems related to atherosclerosis, narrowing of the coronary arteries, the main blood supply of the heart, leading to things like heart attacks, uh, leading to things like heart failure, leading to things like abnormal heart rhythms. Now that's not the whole picture. There are adults with valve problems and adults with lots of other things, but the majority of cardiovascular diseases, and unfortunately the majority of cardiovascular deaths in the United States from adults are related to atherosclerotic disease. Whereas in children, uh, that's very uncommon. And the vast majority of children, as we'll see, have structural problems with their hearts. Um, and that's what we're here to talk about tonight. Um, and there are many adults who have structural problems with their hearts. And as our surgeons have gotten better at repairing hearts, there are now more young adults 
alive today with repaired congenital heart disease than there are children with congenital heart disease, and we crossed that boundary somewhere in the year around 2001, 2002. So in fact, there are many of us, maybe some of you in the audience, who have a patch inside your heart or an artificial valve or are actually even maybe missing a heart chamber. <clears throat> so this is a normal heart, and if you did your homework and you read the chapter, you know that the heart has four chambers, um, it has four valves, and uh, without going into a lot of detail, basically blood comes from the upper and the lower part of the body after the body has used up oxygen in the blood, travels into a small receiving chamber on the right side called the right atrium, goes through a valve, and the purpose of the valves is to keep blood flowing in one direction only, into a big pump, and that pump on the right side is called the right ventricle. Pumped out through another valve into a big artery going to the lungs called the pulmonary artery. The purpose of sending blood into the lungs is to provide oxygen into the blood. And so the lungs supply oxygen, the blood comes back through some veins into a small collecting chamber on the left side called the left atrium, through another valve, and into the biggest and most important pumping chamber in the heart called the left ventricle. Because this pumping chamber pumps blood through a big blood vessel, the largest artery in our body called the aorta, and that takes blood to the entire body. So essentially, the right side of the heart is only pumping blood into the lungs. The left side of the heart has to do the heavy duty work, pumping blood to the entire body. And the blue blood is usually on the right side of the heart, goes into the lungs, and then the red blood is on the left side of the heart. When heart development goes awry, it can be something fairly straightforward or fairly simple. Uh, this is one of the most common congenital, and congenital we mean by inborn heart defects, called a ventricular septal defect. Septum is the Latin word for wall, and this is essentially a hole in the wall between the two major chambers, the two ventricles. Um, and that would be an example of a fairly easily correctable, straightforward type of heart defect. However, when things go wrong, sometimes they can really go wrong, and this is an example of one of the most severe congenital heart defects called hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Hypoplasia uh, means a failure to form or failure to develop or grow. And in this situation, you can see there is a normally shaped, normally sized right-sided pumping chamber and a very, very tiny little sort of great size little left ventricle. And so this is one of the most challenging conditions that we as cardiologists have to deal with um, because essentially we're left with a child who is missing essentially an entire half of their heart and in that sense the most important half, the left side. And we'll talk a little bit about this later. But that's kind of the spectrum from things that are relatively straightforward like a simple hole or a leaky valve to something as major <clears throat> as missing an entire chamber of the heart. So <clears throat> we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about how this miraculous thing called the heart develops, um, but I'm not going to go into exquisite detail. If you're interested in that, there are some really wonderful uh, resources, both on the internet and good books on cardiac embryology. But this is what the embryo looks like at about 30 days of gestation, and the developing heart by that point is actually in the human pretty well developed. Our hearts start out essentially as a straight tube. So by about three weeks after uh, 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 three weeks of gestation, uh, this is what we look like. And if we stopped at that point, we'd be a fish. <laughs> this straight tube then undergoes a number of conformational changes induced by a whole host of genes that get turned on and turned off in various parts of the heart that cause that straight tube to begin to loop. And this looping takes the tube and folds it up into a, um, into a pocket that is the beginnings of the development of those two primitive ventricles. And so if we go, whoops, if we go to the next step, this is what our heart looks like. It has a primitive right ventricle, it has a primitive left ventricle, it has the atria sitting here, and it has a bunch of blood vessels coming off the top, but they're not separated right and left. Everything is all connected to each other. And in fact, if we stopped at that point, we'd be a lizard. <laughs> and fish and lizards do perfectly well by having these circulations where the blue and the red blood mix together. <clears throat> but we're not lizards. And eventually, <clears throat> walls grow up to separate the two ventricles. Eventually, the two atria actually move a little bit over towards the right so that the right atrium connects to the right ventricle and the left to the left ventricle. And then this big 
blood vessel at the top, which we call the truncus, actually has to divide into two blood vessels, one going to the lungs and one going to the body. And this process is pretty much complete by around 50 days of gestation. And most of the changes that occur from that point on in terms of cardiac development are just enlargement. So this has to grow and get bigger as the uh, fetus now begins to grow, but all the structures that need to be there are basically pretty much formed by that point. Therefore, agents which affect the development, such as drugs which we call teratogens, things that can cause an abnormality in development, um, really have to hit the heart during this early phase, sometimes before a woman even realizes that she is pregnant, um, in, in order to cause major problems in, in, this, in this development. Likewise, genes that act to cause one of these chambers not to form or cause a hole to begin or a valve not to develop, also to have to have some of their effect during this early time. And that makes treating this, we're trying to prevent it by doing fetal or embryonic therapy is quite difficult because by this point, um, as I said, most people might not even realize that they're pregnant, but certainly imaging a heart at that stage and trying to do something to repair it in utero is a bit difficult, but not impossible, and we'll, we'll get to that towards the end of the talk. <clears throat> sure. How big is that heart if you may? Uh, in a human, it's, um, oh, you know, like a millimeter, two millimeters in, in size. It's, it's pretty small. Um, there are specialized cells <clears throat> which start out at the <clears throat> center of the embryo and migrate out to different parts of the embryo. Let's play that movie again. Um, and uh, scientists have been able to tag these cells. These particular ones are called neural crest cells. And they form not only the heart, but they form multiple other organs. So it's actually not uncommon to see a child who has a congenital heart defect who may have other problems with other parts of their body um, that are formed by those same cells. So sometimes these things come in groups together. And it's important for us to recognize that because you don't want to be taking care of someone with a heart problem and realize that they have a problem with their liver or they have a problem with their thyroid gland or their immune system isn't working. And as we're putting that together, we're not going to be able to care for the child appropriately if we don't have all that information. And we'll talk about the team of people that needs to be called into play to take care of these patients. <clears throat> so why are we spending all your time here talking about this, what exactly is the scope of the problem? Congenital heart defects are one of the most common birth defects, as, as Phil alluded. They occur in eight per thousand newborns, so it's almost 1% of the population. It's a lot of kids, one out of every hundred almost. Um, but actually, it's more common than that because there's another condition that we cardiologists don't even count as a congenital lesion, and that's a minor abnormality of the aortic valve called a bicuspid aortic valve that about 3% of the population has. So probably about seven or eight of you guys sitting here today have probably have a bicuspid aortic valve, if the statistics are to be believed, which means that congenital heart disease really affects about 4% of us. And that's a lot of people. It is also as Phil also alluded, still, despite all the advances we've come, uh, and I'm going to be telling you about, still one of the leading causes of death due to birth defects in kids today. Um, there are about 35 to 40,000 children born with congenital heart disease in the United States. About half of them will require surgery in the first couple of months of life. So this is the problem. This is a problem that can only be tackled by a collaborative approach. And what I'm going to talk about today, going back actually back to the 1950s when this field first started, is that this has been a collaborative effort. It's been an effort of, of physicians who take care of patients at the bedside, of clinical scientists who analyze the data based on clinical trials, of basic scientists who work at the molecular and basic level figuring out how cells work, and actually, there's been a very strong component going back probably, I think, more than any other field of engineers, bioengineers, even before there was a field of bioengineering. Um, if you look right across the street, right as you walked over here, if you pass the Clark Center, you'll see the nexus of, of those kinds of interactions that is occurring here at Stanford, where bioengineering engineers, doctors, um, meet regularly with each other um, in order to kind of tackle the questions that um, we're going to address later today. And that's a very exciting thing. And it's nice to have it right at the nexus point of the School of Medicine and the School of Engineering. All right. 
if you were born in 1952 and you had a very simple heart condition, just a hole between two chambers of your heart, something today that our surgeons wouldn't get all that excited about, it would have been a death sentence. There was nothing that could be done. If you were lucky, uh, you would have had bad heart failure and you might not have survived beyond the first uh, couple of months of life. And if you were either lucky or unlucky, you might have lived long enough to live to your you know, early teenage years. Um, but that was about it. And then <clears throat> a pioneering surgeon, Walton Lillehei, <laughs> University of Minnesota, in March 1954, did the first open heart operation. Um, and he had previously done a version of this operation in, in, in about two years earlier where he cooled the patient down, um, stopped the heart, stopped the circulation. But this was a unique ad advance. And I don't know if any of you have noticed off in the corner here, that's not a mirror. Okay? This is in the era before heart-lung machines were invented. So if you're going to stop the heart, open it up, and, and, and suture up a hole, how do you maintain the circulation? Today we use a heart-lung machine. In 1954, Walt Lillehei used this little boy's dad. And this is called cross, human cross-circulation. And they basically took the arterial blood from the dad, who's laying in a bed right next to the, to the little boy, and brought it over and used it to essentially provide oxygen and blood flow for his son while Lillehei tried to, to, to do that repair. And it's amazing how much grief he got from many of his colleagues because at that time, people felt that operating on the heart was sacrilegious. And some of his surgical colleagues tried to ban him from some of the national organizations because they felt that he had violated some unwritten rule, um, probably going back to Aristotle's time about the belief about what the function of the heart is. And if you, again, read a little bit of, of the text, you know that, that Galen and others kind of proved that you know, the heart wasn't exactly where all the mentation and our seat of our soul was. But it's amazing how those attitudes can last for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. This operation was a pioneering operation, and there were several others done at several other centers. I, I want you to note that, that one of the members of that team was our own Norm Shumway, who founded the uh, surgical, cardiac surgical program here at Stanford, went on to pioneer not only the field of congenital heart surgery, but most importantly, the field of heart transplantation. Um, and uh, he was the um, member of that team who brought those advances out here. Um, well, not too long afterwards, um, one of the first collaborations between medicine and industry took place when John Gibbon um, convinced the president of IBM at the time, a guy named Tom Watson, to help support him to develop a heart-lung machine. And this is what the first heart-lung machine uh, looks like. And that essentially allowed us not to have to use a parent or a relative, but to essentially take over the circulation, pump the blood around the body, provide oxygen into it. And this may be one of the first examples of an industry um, medical collaboration. This is another one. <clears throat> well, when I show this, this, this picture, a lot of people say, oh yeah, I know that garage. That, you know, it's got, got, got to be Hewlett Packard, right? Well, you got to notice, maybe you don't see it, but there's actually snow on the ground. So <laughs> this is not Palo Alto. <laughs> so when Dr. Lillehei first started doing surgeries, one of the problems is the area where he was suturing, right near where these holes were, is a place where the electrical system of the heart runs. And the electrical system in some patients runs very close to the lip of where those holes were. And every once in a while when he put his stitch on to put a little patch in that hole, he would bump against that electrical system and cause it some damage. And when that happens, the electrical activity of the heart cannot be coordinated. The impulse can't get from the top of the heart down to the bottom. We call that heart block. And unfortunately, in some cases that's permanent and if in the era before pacemakers, that was a lethal complication. But in those days, they actually did have pacemakers. The problems were the pacemaker was the size of a refrigerator. And they had to be plugged into the wall. And so what Lulahai realized is that some of those patients with heart block actually got better. But it sometimes took pacing for several weeks before they got better. So you can imagine wheeling a patient down the hall from the operating room with a refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> 
and he had orderlies with 100-foot extension cords because you couldn't unplug the patient for more than a second, basically plugging and unplugging this device as they moved the patient down the hall. And they had actually had to relocate the intensive care unit because you couldn't go up in an elevator. So he asked uh, the nurse who ran the operating room, don't you have a better solution? Isn't there somebody who fixes the equipment in here and the monitors who can help me come up with something? And she said, you know what, if I really need some help, I don't go to the hospital guys, but I go down the street to this little garage and there's a guy who runs a small television repair shop down there. And I want you to go and talk to him and I think, I think we can solve the problem. Well, it turned out, Lil High trudged down the street and it turned out that month in popular electronics was the first transistorized project. It was a metronome. And um, they figured, well, a metronome tells time, and so does a pacemaker. So why don't we just change the voltage characteristics of this metronome, and let's see if we can build something. And they did. And that individual, that gentleman who was running that shop was a gentleman named Earl Bakken. The company that he founded from this is called Medtronic. Um, and this is their first pacemaker. And many of you may know that this is now the, one of the largest biomedical companies in the world, and um, pacemakers is their subspecialty. But this is what that initial box was. And again, another example going back way into the 1950s of the importance of people from different disciplines putting their heads together. <clears throat> another important advance. Uh, right after World War II, there was a lot of radar and sonogra sonogram machines sitting around with no, nothing to do with them. Um, and so a bunch of scientists took one of those machines and started playing around with it, and they actually showed that you could get images of the human body um, by using sonography, by using ultrasound. Well, I actually saw this when I was a student at MIT. I, I saw a demonstration of this. We call this B-mode echo. And you can see that this definitely looks like a heart, right? Um, you can? Doesn't look like a heart? No. Okay. Well, when I was a, a, a resident, this is what an echocardiogram looked like. It was a bunch of squiggly lines, and that's actually the mitral valve opening and closing. But nowadays, we have, um, starting oh, in, the, in the early, mid-1980s, we have much improved imaging. Here, you can actually see something that now begins to look like a heart. We have four chambers, and actually, here's a hole, a small hole between the two atria called an atrial septal defect. This is exactly that hole that was repaired by Lula High when he did his first operation. We use a technique called color Doppler that allows us to take advantage of the Doppler principle in, in, in physics to look at the directionality of blood. We can see that there's blood going this way across the hole because of the color. And nowadays, um, echocardiography shows us some pretty accurate images. Um, we can see here four heart chambers. Here's the mitral valve opening and closing very nicely the tricuspid valve on the right side of the heart, left ventricle, right ventricle, two atria, nice intact wall between them. Uh, we get actually quite nice images now from echocardiography, <laughs> come a long way in the last 30 years. Um, but we've taken a little bit of a hint from the folks at NASA, um, <clears throat> and we've learned how to do a lot of really complex digital image processing, um, again, based on computer programs that were not initially developed for medicine, but initially developed for other fields. This is actually the inside of the wall of the heart, and we're actually tracking each individual segment to see, make sure that all the segments are working uh, in coordination. And that's important for patients with both congenital heart defects, but it's actually important for adults who've had heart attacks or have other reasons for having heart failure, because sometimes some parts of the wall will work better than others. And this is what that looks like. This is a technique called Doppler tissue imaging, and this is the heart. And what we're doing is we're tracking each of these little color dots, tracks one segment of the wall of the heart. And this is all done automatically. We don't have to sit and paste a little dot in each of these locations. You put the picture on, you turn on the machine, and the machines are that sophisticated. <clears throat> and as you can see here, this is the heart contracting and relaxing, contracting and relaxing. And you can see here each of the colored segments is moving in the same direction at the same time. The heart is going like this, which is what it should. This is a heart that's failing. And as you can see here, each of these different segments is going willy-nilly in its own direction at its own time. And this is a condition we call dyssynchrony, when one wall of the heart is not helping out the other wall. 
well, what does that look like? Now, I'm, I'm focusing on imaging, but I'm going to take a slight detour and talk for a second about treatment because, in fact, um, one of our docs at, at, at Packer Children's, Ann Dubin, um, has, has actually revolutionized the treatment of children with heart failure by using a technique that actually was developed by both uh, Dr. Dubin as well as many of the adult cardiologists around the country called resynchronization pacing. And here you can see one of those newfangled pacemakers, um, and you can see the wires going up to the heart. What does that do? Well, this is an ultrasound, an echocardiogram of a dyssynchronous heart, a heart that's been damaged. In this case, it's a child who had a virus of the heart that affected the heart muscle. And if you look here, this is the left ventricle. This is the mitral valve. This is the one wall of the ventricle, and this is the septum, the wall between the two ventricles. And if you look, as this wall moves inwards, this wall moves in, in, in the same direction. It's going like this. You can't get good squeeze when essentially this wall is not moving and helping out that other wall. Well, just by changing the pacing characteristics, changing when you activate each different segment of the heart, you can do that. Now, you can see this wall is moving. This wall isn't moving all that well, but it's not working against the free wall. And essentially, this particular patient here was on the list for heart transplant because they were in pretty significant heart failure, wasn't able to go to school, wasn't able to get up and walk around. Um, after a couple of weeks of uh, just having a pacemaker put in, we were able to get this particular child off the heart transplant list, and to date, this child has stayed off that list. Um, again, based on a technique in imaging that we were able to take advantage of that told us that these walls were moving abnormally, um, and then taking advantage of a technique that, that had been de developed long ago in the 1950s and then made much more sophisticated, we do something called resynchronization pacing. <clears throat> Let's get back to imaging. So if you look at this, I, I know that last week you, you probably had some, Dr. Rubin probably showed you some pretty phenomenal pictures, <clears throat> so I'm not going to show you too many um, because I think he has better toys than I do. Um, but this is what a traditional CT or MRI scan is. If you've ever had an MRI of, your, your, of a knee or a whatever, when I look at it and they look at it on the field, I say, I don't understand what I'm looking at. I mean, that doesn't really look like a heart. I mean, well, there's the spine, there's the lungs, and there kind of is a heart in there. Humans don't really see things in two dimensions. Things don't exist in two dimensions. So in fact, being able to take these kinds of imaging and then use computers to build three-dimensional models um, has been one of the major advances. And this is a child who was born, remember I said that those two big blood vessels coming off the top of the heart initially start out as one, and then they have to divide. A wall comes down, divides them into two. That process doesn't happen. We get a connection between the two, and that's called an aortopulmonary window. Here's one blood vessel, here's the other, and this is a big connection between the two, and that's really bad, and it requires um, a, a heart surgery because these kids usually have torrential blood flow in their lungs and really are in, in, in pretty bad shape. Anybody remember this movie? Anybody a science fiction fan? I'm a big Isaac Asimov fan. Well, Isaac Asimov was one of those people who really foresaw the future. And if you read some of the stuff that he wrote in the 60s, it's amazing what he was able to, uh, what he was able to predict. And one of the, the things he wrote, he wrote this, this book called Fantastic Voyage. It became a movie, I think, starting, uh, starring Raquel Welch, interestingly enough. Um, <laughs> And it was about a scientist who had a brain tumor and was dying, and a bunch of doctors who were needed to save this scientist. Um, but the only way they could get at the tumor was by being put into a little submarine. And then they had a shrinking ray that basically hit the submarine. The submarine shrank, and then they got injected into the scientist's bloodstream. And if it's, 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 it's the special effects in it are really bad. Um, but they floated around in the scientist's bloodstream and they fought off the white blood cells that tried to attack them and they cured the, the tumor and, and they got out. Um, and so that was Asimov's, um, Asimov's uh, vision is uh, it wouldn't be great if we could operate from inside the body instead of outside. 
That's science fiction back in the 1960s. It's actually reality today. And I'm going to show you a technique that's called fly-through imaging of that same child with that connection between those two blood vessels. So this is using CT angiography. So there is, in fact, no catheter, no vessel in the body that has um, a catheter. Yet we're inside the heart. We're diving down into the, into the apex of the ventricle. And then we're coming up. Here you can see one of the heart valves. Okay, and there is one of the other heart valves. We're now coursing through the aortic valve, coming out into the main blood vessel, the aorta. Here, a blood vessel is going to the head and neck, and then we're going to dive around, dive down, swim down to where we should not be able to go. Because when you're in the aorta, you shouldn't be able to get into the pulmonary artery. But there's a big hole connecting the two blood vessels. And so, in fact, in a second here, we're going to swing around and enter into the pulmonary artery. Right through there is the hole. And there are the right and left pulmonary arteries, which we shouldn't be able to see from this view. This is better than being in a submarine and floating around in the body. <laughs> this is allowing us to pinpoint heart defects from the inside as well as from the outside. Um, and this is all available using standard CT and MRI machines, but using very sophisticated computer processing. This is another imaging technique. Here is a patient, and I think Dr. Rubin probably showed you pictures that look like this. We're peeling away different layers from the body in order to get inside the body to see, in this case, this is the trachea, the main airway in the body. And essentially, it's got a narrowing in it. And we're looking at that narrowing. And the narrowing is caused by an aberrant blood vessel. And now we're going down the trachea to take a look at that narrowing from the inside. Again, we don't have any instrumentation in the patient. This is all done with computer processing. And there is the area of narrowing there. And that's where the surgeons need to do their operation. Um, and this, again, is called fly-through imaging. And it's something, this, is, this was presented at one of our conferences. This is not stuff that's out in the future. This is being used clinically today. How else is bioengineering helping us in terms of designing better treatments for children with heart disease? Um, well, I showed you a picture of a child with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Again, the situation where the left side of the heart doesn't exist. One of the techniques we use to fix that condition involves taking the blood vessel from the upper body called the superior vena cava and the blood vessel from the lower body called the inferior vena cava and connecting them directly to the lungs. And the reason we do that is because if you only have one heart pumping chamber, You've got to use that one chamber to pump blood to the body. That's the important thing. And you can figure out another way to get blood to the lungs. That's a less important part of the circulation. It doesn't require as much, uh, much uh, pressure that the heart has to develop. And essentially, we've found that you can just connect the veins in the body directly up to the lungs. And actually, these kids can do pretty well. This operation was developed by Bill Norwood in the mid-1980s and has been utilized since that time. And we now have some 20 and 25-year-old survivors of this uh, initial operation. However, there is a problem. These kids do great when they're sitting around. They go to school, at rest, sitting and, 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 and relaxing. They do fine. But when they exercise, they run out of energy. And so one of our cardiologists, Jeff Feinstein, working with a mechanical engineer uh, who specializes in fluid dynamics named uh, Charlie Taylor, decided that they would model this using a pretty sophisticated computer modeling system. And so they essentially took patients, and they took the data from those patients, and then they modeled what would happen if the patient was at rest and with exercise. And what you're seeing here is the red represents areas of high shear stress, areas where the blood is, if you imagine, coming here, hitting the corner, and basically losing energy as it's going around the corner. And you see there's a little bit of red there. Well, look what happens when the patient is exercising. As the blood accelerates, as your needs of getting lots of blood flow to your body and your muscles during exercise, there is an enormous loss of energy there. So no wonder why these kids have trouble exercising. So in the old days, the way that a surgeon devised a new operation is they tried it out. Okay? They opened up the patient, and they said, hmm, I'm not sure how to fix this, but we're going to give it a try. And that still goes on to a large degree in really complex heart surgeries. However, wouldn't it be nice if you could actually do that on the computer? And so uh, Dr. Feinstein and his colleagues said, well, what happens if we take that lower body connection and make it into a Y shape? 
Will that benefit the patient or will it potentially make things worse? Because conceivably, the flow dynamics into each of the lungs is gonna be a little bit better. And that's the modeling that they did. And essentially, here's the data. And if you look here, here is the Y graph. And you can see here, this is the loss of energy, the efficiency of the circuit as you increase exercise capacity. And look what the difference is between that red line and the blue line here. Uh, we are now putting together an uh, institutional review board approval uh, to do this in patients. Um, and we're hoping that we can introduce this, uh, this new operation sometime within the next uh, 12 to 24 months at, at, at Stanford. Um, there's a lot more testing that needs to be done, but it's nice that we were at least able to do some of the initial validation on a computer rather than having to do it in a, in a child. Sure. Sure. So what we can do is we can use what, what Dr. Taylor knows about fluid dynamics to model different conditions like exercise. Okay. Um, and then we actually put real patients through an MRI scanner and we, in the lab at, over at the, um, at the Clark Center, there's a special MRI scanner that has a non-magnetic exercise uh, a bike attached to it. So we can actually have a real patient exercise. We can compare the modeling data from the computer to the real patient. And if we see that our model is pretty accurate, then we can go on and do experiments like this. Okay, now, I, we have not yet done a patient with this operation yet, but what this modeling technique has given us is it has allowed us to experiment with different sizes of Y graft. So for example, do you keep the overall diameter here the same, meaning do you have two smaller Ys, or do you try to maintain the diameter going out into each branch, and what are the different effects on blood flow? So we can try 20 different combinations on the computer before we go ahead and actually try it in the operating room. That's the advantage. But every time you do a step, like looking at seeing whether or not the exercise flow is real, you, can, you actually go back and you do that in a real patient. Um, and the first patients who will have this operation, if, 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 if the family is willing to consent to it, they will be studied using MRI exercise so we can validate whether these results are important. On the other hand, from my perspective as a practicing cardiologist, what I would hope to see is that this kid gets on a treadmill or is able to practice in, um, you know, play baseball or soccer or a lot of those other things that kids with this condition can't do. So in fact, if they can do those things, that's good enough for me. Other questions? Are these veins, mm -hmm. if I may show you the white line, are these, these, these are veins in the inferior vena cava? So this is the inferior vena cava, and essentially there's a tube that is essentially brought up here and has two components to it. So it's, it's basically looks like a Y instead of this format, which is basically a T. And some surgeons actually do the operation this way with the upper and the lower you know, right on top of each other. And that's the, we've shown that's the worst variation because they collide with each other. Our surgeons have been doing it with some offset for a number of years now, where at least you get flow from here and flow here, and at least you don't get that collision phenomenon. But it seems like at least, again, on a computer, the best option is probably to do some kind of Y circuit. Now, there's a lot that has to be done before you take this and then start doing it in patients. And so there's animal work that has to be done. There's validation that we can fit something like this in the body. Um, and there is, of course, pretty stringent institutional approval that needs to go through, especially when you're doing this on children. Um, but we think that this has a potential for causing significant benefit for kids. Any other questions about this one? We move on? Good. Okay. So we talked about diagnostics. Um, we talked about using the, the engineering and diagnostic uh, tools to design new operations. What about doing things to fix the heart that don't require surgery? Um, well, most of you probably are aware of angioplasty. Some of you may have had an angioplasty. Um, I don't think it's well known that 10 years before the first angioplasty, uh, a pediatric cardiologist used a balloon technique. 
to repair a heart. Okay? See, pediatric cardiologists are really on the forefront here. And that's what I'm going to try to convince you. So um, this is a condition called transposition of the great arteries, one of the most common reasons for babies to have what's called blue baby syndrome. Um, and in this case, remember those two blood vessels coming off the top of the heart had started out as one vessel, and then there's a wall that divides them. Well, if the wall grows in the wrong direction, what happens is we wind up with the aorta, the big blood vessel going to the body, coming off of the right side of the heart, the right ventricle. And we have the pulmonary artery, the blood vessel going to the lungs, coming off the left side of the heart. Now, that's a real problem because we have the blue blood coming back into the right side of the heart, and that blood goes right out to the body. And we have the red blood coming into the left side of the heart, and that blood goes right out to the lungs. And so we have two parallel circulations. And actually, during fetal life, it's not all that important because when you're a fetus, your mom's placenta is supplying oxygen to your body. But the moment the baby's born and the umbilical cord is clipped, these kids can get into a lot of trouble. And um, back in 1951 or 52, there wasn't an operation that was available for these patients. Um, but Bill Rashkin, a pediatric cardiologist uh, at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, noticed that there were some of these kids who also were born with a hole between the two upper chambers of their heart, an atrial septal defect. And if they had that hole, they weren't as sick, they weren't as blue because some of the blue blood could scoot across the hole and get out to the lungs to pick up oxygen, and some of the red blood could flow across the hole and get out to the body. And so Rashkin said, well, if a little hole is good, then a big hole is obviously gonna be better. But they couldn't operate in the heart. I mean, again, heart surgery was several years away. The mortality from this condition was 90% at one year. Only 10% of the kids who had this lived. So, Rashkin said, well, there are balloons that are used for taking care of problems uh, in the kidneys and other parts of the body, never have been used in the heart. What happens if I take one of those balloons and I put it into the left side of the heart and I blow it up really big and I yank it? Um, so they, they did this experiment on a, a number of animals first, a number of dogs, and showed that it was doable and safe. And this became a technique that actually Dr. Rashkin's name is, is attached to called the Rashkin atrial septostomy. And I'll show you a picture of this because we still do this today on kids with some, some heart conditions. So uh, this is the heart. This is an ultrasound. Here's the left side of the atrium, the left atrium. Here's the right atrium. Here's the ventricle beneath there. And there's the balloon. And you can see the balloon is now being, it's advanced from, a, from the patient's leg up into the heart, and then it's blown up, and it's almost the size of the entire atrium. And in a second, you'll see that it's gonna be essentially pulled back across the wall in one big move, and that opens up a nice hole, and you can actually see with the color Doppler here that there's flow across the hole. Just with this procedure, Dr. Rashkin dropped the mortality from 90% to 10%. Big advance. Now, there still wasn't an operation to fix this. Today, there is but it took another four or five years before surgeons started exploring operations to repair this condition, but they couldn't have done it because the babies were too small and too unstable, and therefore, due to an interventional procedure led by Bill Rashkin, we were able to essentially make this big progress. They say that the success of the Rashkin is dependent on the jerk at the end of the catheter, and having done these a long time ago, I would test that that is probably true. You can't just scoot it through. You really have to yank. And when you're watching the heart on the fluoroscope, it really goes like this. Um, and it is not an easy procedure to do, and it does have some risk associated with it. Hand in the back. What prevents the, um, the enlargement from closing up? What prevents the enlargement from closing up is the question. And the answer is that once that, that wall is a very thin wall between the two atria, once that's opened up, if it's opened up well, um, it usually stays open. In fact, the surgeons, when they go in and then fix the heart later, they actually have to put a patch there to close it. Um, but again, if you, if, you, if you don't pull very hard, you just stretch it, and then it, it closes back again. You really need to rip it. And again, having done these for a long time, I don't do these anymore, but having done them for 15 years, it's not one of my favorite things to do.
Narrowing of valves, a uh, very common problem in, in congenital heart disease. This is a nice, normal aortic valve. You can see three leaflets of the valve. See how nice and thin they are and how they fit together? This is a patient with a very severe condition called aortic stenosis. This valve has malformed. It's not very big, and you can see it looks almost like a volcano. It has very thick leaflets, and there's a little tiny hole at the center. Um, and this is a condition that can affect both the aortic valve on the left side of the heart as well as the pulmonary valve on the right side. What do we do? Well, you know, years and years ago, the only thing available was surgery. And then a pediatric cardiologist named Gene Kahn back in 1984 took a balloon and said, well, if we can open up coronary arteries with a balloon, maybe we can open up valves. Um, and so you put a balloon across the block valve. Here you can see the indentations made on the balloon by the thickened valve tissue. The balloon is then blown up to very high atmospheric pressure and pop, the valve opens up. And here's a picture before and after. We've injected some dye into the right ventricle here and here you can see a narrow jet of blood weaving this thickened valve. Here's the opening of the valve but here is the blood coming out because the, essentially the valve is so narrowed now and afterwards you can see essentially that's been fixed. For procedures on the right side of the heart, this essentially is almost always curative, meaning patients will not require surgery. For procedures on the aortic valve, the more important part of the circulation, this is usually a procedure which allows us to temporize till we get the kid till they're a little bit older. And we'll talk about why that's important in children in a minute. Okay. What else can we do? Well, that first operation that, that um, Luahai did was to close a hole between the upper chambers of the heart. And isn't it great that he invented that? Well, we don't even do that operation hardly anymore because we now have a device that can do that. This is an ASD septal occluder device, a little catheter, and it has a little basket that comes out. And as you keep on pushing the basket, it gets bigger. And then it's made of a special material, uh, nickel, titanium, nitinol, that is actually made that will hold a particular form. So even though you've scrunched it up in that catheter, once it comes out, it develops the form that it was molded in. And if you keep on pushing, you get this little double basket, a little sandwich there, and then you can collapse it on each other, and there you go. You've now got a patch. And then you just unscrew the little catheter there, and you're done. Pretty simple. No open heart surgery, no cuts, um, and this is what that looks like. So this is an ultrasound uh, that's being done. Here's the left atrium, here's the right atrium. Here's the hole between the two chambers. Here's a catheter going across there. And here's the first part of the device that's been put out there on the left side of the, of the hole. And here's the other part that's now on the right side of the hole. And all the cardiologist has to do is pull back a little bit. The two halves lock into each other and then check the position. Make sure that there's no blood going through there. If you're happy, you just unscrew it you go home. Patient stays one night in the hospital, goes home the next day. No scar, no post-operative recovery period. Um, and this is now being used instead of surgery for the majority of atrial defects. There is now a device that's in clinical trials to do this with other holes in the heart between the two more important chambers, the two ventricles. Um, and uh, th those devices should be available with probably within the next year or two. What about heart valves? Um, well. Um, Replacing a heart valve usually requires opening up the chest and opening up the heart. Not anymore. Um, now, uh, the adult cardiologists have really taken the lead on this one to a large degree, but I'm going to show you a procedure that we actually did here on a little nine-month-old patient of mine um, that actually was the youngest patient in the world to ever have this done. That is, wouldn't it be nice if we could actually put in a new valve without having to open up the chest? Well, we can do that. So you can take this is what a normal, what we call valve conduit is. This is the kind of replacement uh, 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 prosthesis that would be put into a patient who needed a replacement pulmonary artery, main blood vessel. And it it's a little Dacron conduit that contains a pig valve, a porcine valve. So here is our surgeon, Mohan Reddy, removing that from the conduit that it came in and actually sewing it into a stent. And this is the same kind of stent that would be used to keep stent open a, a coronary artery, except it's a lot bigger. Um, and there it is. There is a valve that's been implanted into a stent. Well, the valve is tissue, so it's squishable, and so is the stent. You can now squish the valve and the stent down and place it over a catheter. You can then advance the catheter into the heart, 
This is the pulmonary artery, the blood vessel going to the lungs. Here's the narrowed area where this child's major problem was. And she had been spending, oh, at the time she was nine months old, I think she had spent three or four months of her life in the intensive care unit off and on because she was so sick. And now we've expanded that stent. And now, lo and behold, look what happens. The leakage coming back here, this is all leakage, has disappeared. The valve isn't leaking anymore. It's open. Uh, when we were monitoring this during the procedure, this is her ultrasound. And here's the left ventricle, and here's the right ventricle. Normally, the left ventricle should be larger. The right ventricle should be smaller. Her right ventricle, there was so much leakage that that ventricle had just blown up like a balloon and was squishing the left side of her heart. Within 10 minutes, this happened. Look at the ventricle. It's just shrunk. And um, Noelle's there. She's actually, this was a couple years ago. Um, she's actually now um, another four or five years out after the procedure, and she's done well and has not yet had to have another procedure, although she will at some point. How does that procedure compare to traditional uh, open heart valve replacement? Um, that's a good question, and the answer to that is going to be known with a clinical trial that is just about wrapping up right now in adult patients. Um, in fact, a good friend of mine just had one of these done in her um, aortic valve position. Um, and so what they're doing is they're looking at comparing this kind of treatment versus standard surgery. Um, my guess is that given the, the risks of open heart surgery, especially this is very commonly done in much older people. Uh, the friend of mine who had this done was in her uh, early 80s. Uh, recovering from open heart surgery at that age would have been a, a major task. Uh, she still had a prolonged recovery, but she bounced back. She didn't have to have any, any scars, anything open. Um, I, I think that, that most people feel that this will wind up becoming the standard of practice for many, but not all valves, especially those adult valves that tend to build up a lot of calcium on them, um, because again, it can be done without having to enter the body. The, uh, the valve uh, is fixed in size. The child grows, ah. the heart grows. Oh, you, in, you are a plant. I put you in the audience specifically <laughs> because you're going to be, I need you for the next part of my life. So I'll hold that thought for a minute, and, and we'll talk about that in a minute. That's an excellent question. So, uh, this, so the clinical trial that has just, I think, been completed in the U.S. is an aortic valve. Uh, trial. Um, there is a trial that's gone on in children um, and young adults who have congenital heart disease of pulmonary valves. And this has been, uh, 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 Dr. Bonhoeffer in Germany has done several hundred of these in kids, and, uh, but not mitral valves yet because there's really no place to put the stent. So maybe one day someone will, some bright engineer will invent a way of being able to put a mitral valve in. Um, we certainly do mitral angioplasty using a balloon, but nobody has tried doing a replacement valve. So the old valve in her case was so damaged that it was just basically leaking, in which case the stent basically just you know, sort of plasters the, the valve leaflets down on the wall. But that's this similar situation when they do this in aortic valves with, that have built up a lot of calcium in older adults. Essentially, the stent goes in, and the pressure of those balloons is pretty significant. It basically disrupts the valve, pushes the old valve out of the way, and essentially the new valve is in there. And at least in Dr. Bonhoeffer's experience, they've been able to go back and redo them two or three times in patients as they've gotten older. So if you have one done and the valve deteriorates over time, uh, presumably you can actually go in and have another one done. Um, again, the clinical data, at least on the right side of the heart, we don't know about on the left side of the heart. In the back. So that ASD that they put in to fix the hole between the two valves of the heart, is that, would that be used to fix a, like a PFO at birth? And how big does it have to be before they decide to fix it? Okay, so the question is, and I'm sorry, I haven't been repeating all the questions. I'll try to, if you wave at me or something like that to remind me. 
Um, the question is, there's a condition called a patent foramen ovale, or PFO, um, in the newborn period um, that can sometimes cause problems in adults. So normally in the developing heart, there actually is a hole between the two upper heart chambers, um, and that allows blood to go from the right side of the heart to the left side, um, since again, in the fetus, the lungs are not being used because the mom's placenta is supplying all the blood flow. That hole normally closes um, by about, oh, six years of age or so. But in about 15% of people, it stays open into adulthood. Now, if it's a really tiny hole, we don't usually do anything to close it. However, in some adults, it can be a source of stroke. And the reason for that is that very frequently we develop blood clots in our lower extremities, in our legs. You may bang your leg, you may be sitting on a 12-hour airplane flight, you get a little phlebitis, a little blood clot breaks off. In most of us, that blood clot travels in our body and goes into our lungs, where if it's small enough, it gets absorbed. If you happen to have a little hole between the two upper heart chambers, that little blood clot sometimes can find its way across to the left side of the heart, where if it goes out, it may go to the brain. And that is one of the causes of stroke. So if somebody has a stroke, the current treatment is to look for a patent Freeman ovale, to look for a hole. And then the two options that those patients have are either to go on an anticoagulant for the rest of their life, or to go ahead and have the hole closed. Um, and we do do that using the same device in older patients um, uh, who have, uh, who have uh, patent foramens and who have had strokes. Okay. No other questions? Okay. So we'll say goodbye to Noel and um, move on to answer your question. <clears throat> so replacement heart valves have been around for quite a long time, and they have certainly grown in sophistication but they come in two varieties. Uh, they're somewhat mechanical. Um, you know, they may be made out of carbon, but there's no sense that this is anything other than a mechanical valve. Um, some valves are actually a combination of biologic material and, and, and mechanical material. Or they're what's called tissue valves. They're homographs. They are valves taken from a cadaver. And in children, uh, the preferred valves that we use actually are homograph valves because especially in a small child, they don't make artificial valves big enough. Um, the problem with these valves is that they're not living tissue so they don't grow, and they also tend to deteriorate very quickly within four or five years. So we have two problems in kids where we have to replace a valve that we don't have in, in, in adults. Number one is the valves tend to deteriorate more quickly in kids. Number two is the valve doesn't grow. So even if I had a perfect valve that I could put in my little nine-month-old, by the time she was four years of age, I'd have to go in and replace it again. And by the time she was, oh, eight, nine years of age, I'd have to go and replace it again. And then maybe if I'm lucky, I'll get one more operation when she's a teenager. And then finally, when she's an adult, I can put in one of those mechanical valves, which will last her 30 years. But that's four or five open heart surgeries. Isn't there a better way? And the answer is, this is future, but it's being developed right now. So let me say I could take a sample of the tissue from an artery or vein in my leg. Um, and I take the inner lining of the wall of those blood vessels called endothelial cells, and I grow them up in cell culture. And I have a plate of little cells in culture. They're fun to look at under the microscope, but they don't do very much. Well, if I develop a skeleton that I can grow them on, uh, I can actually make them look any shape I want to. And here's an example of a valve that's been grown over a skeleton made of a biodegradable material. So this skeleton allows the cells to form, in this case, in the shape and size of a valve, but yet will dissolve over time. So by the time it's ready to be taken out of this bioreactor and implanted into somebody, um, it's a living tissue valve. It's derived from the patient's own tissue. So they won't reject it because it's their own, their own, their own cells. Um, and here's an example of what one of those cells, this is actually from a, a, from a rat. It's a rat uh, valve that's grown in a bioreactor in Dr. Frank Hanley's lab. Um, this is currently being worked on. Um, the group at Boston Children's has implanted several of these into animals. 
um, and several of them have lasted for a few years. The good news is that they grow. So if you implant it in a little lamb and wait until they get older, as the lamb grows, the valve grows. The bad news is that Valves are a little bit more complex than just endothelial cells. They are a structure that we still don't fully understand uh, on a molecular and cellular basis. And so they do tend to deteriorate still, not as quickly as do um, tissue valves taken from humans, but we're getting there. And the ideal operation, of course, would be able to do the operation on a child using their own tissue, put a new valve in, and that, that valve would, would, would essentially grow with them and would be a one final operation. We're not there, and we'll probably be there, my guess is, in the next five to ten years. Question? Is there also stem cell uh, work in this area? There is a lot of stem cell work. Not, not quite so much in valves. Um, but we'll talk about stem cells in terms of repairing the heart uh, towards the end of the talk. Yeah. Okay. So let's finish up on, with, we, you know, I've talked a lot about intervention. I, I don't want to ignore our surgical colleagues. Uh, we, we, we employ a number of surgeons uh, at Packard. Um, we actually have two of the, the actual leading cardiac surgeons in the world. Uh, we do, at this entire Stanford program, does 1,100 open heart operations on kids every year. Um, so we do a lot of surgery. About 600 of them are done here at Packard, and the rest are done at some of our satellite sites. Um, we employ 24 pediatric cardiologists just to take care of all these kids. Um, so our surgeons are still very busy. They're still doing a lot of stuff that we haven't yet figured out how to do with a catheter yet. One of the things that our surgeons have, have, have pioneered is the idea of early repair of congenital heart disease. Now, in the old days, and actually in most other centers today, if you have a very small young baby, especially a premature baby, there is no way that anyone would believe that you could actually do surgery. And so actually I was just at a meeting where Dr. Hanley presented his absolutely outstanding results in this area. And what tends to be done is these small babies tend to be nurtured along and the doctors caring for them in the nurseries try to get them to grow bigger but it's very hard to grow if you have a very bad heart condition. And so one of the things that Dr. Hanley has pushed is that if we can restore normal blood flow patterns early on, it's the best potential for the normal growth of the child, the normal neurological development of the child, and more and equally important, normal growth of the heart chambers and blood vessels. And so uh, this is a little Jared. Uh, back in 2005, Dr. Reddy operated on this little baby. This baby had transposition, that condition where the two blood vessels are switched around. And Jared was about 800 grams at the time this surgery was done. Uh, was probably the smallest uh, child at that stage ever to have open heart surgery. The, the youngest actually and the smallest we've done at this point now is 660 grams. So just a little bit over a pound in size. Um, and just to say that this is what Jared looked like right after surgery, and here he is uh, a couple years later. So um, uh, the survival rate is good. It's not as good as it is for all open heart surgery. Somebody um, asked me today, uh, earlier before we started, what, is, what are the risks associated with heart surgery these days for kids? Our program survival rate um, for those 550 or so kids we operate on is um, about 98.2%. Um, and so for kids who are this small, it goes up, the survival rate goes down to somewhere around 90%. But you know, telling that to anybody who witnessed the previous era in heart surgery where, where the survival might have been 10 or 20%, we certainly have come a long way. Well, wouldn't it be nice if we actually could do something to prevent some of this stuff from happening? Um, you know, we talk about prevention in adult heart disease. If you uh, eat well and you exercise regularly, you can go out and jog with, with our dean every morning at four in the morning and um, uh, presumably keep yourself pretty healthy if you don't get struck by lightning. <laughs> but, um, but that's prevention of things that, you know, honestly, I also counsel my patients. I don't want to spend, you know, all these resources and hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to fix some kid's heart and then have them smoke and sit around playing Nintendo all day. So we actually, <laughs> we actually do do a lot of lifestyle counseling. But is there prevention that we can actually do for congenital heart disease? Um, and that's an area that's fairly new. 
um, most severe congenital heart defects actually can be detected on an ultrasound during pregnancy. And they can be detected as early as about 17 or 18 weeks of gestation, about halfway through. Early detection is valuable because it can improve prenatal care. We have a chance then if a child is, if a mom is known to be carrying a fetus that has a pretty bad heart condition, we have some time to counsel the family and get them, you know, to figure out not only what they want to do with the pregnancy, but more importantly, how they're going to deal with this child, what kinds of surgeries might be necessary for the child, um, and that improves outcome. But unfortunately, only about 30% of newborns with congenital heart disease are diagnosed prenatally, and that means that a uh, mom who gives birth to a baby, a blue baby, uh, let's say over at, in, in Fremont, that baby has to then be rushed across in an ambulance a, across the, the bridge, hopefully not at rush hour, um, to Packard so that we can stabilize the baby. Um, so it would be nice to be able to increase this prenatal diagnostic rate. And actually, we have a program where our uh, pediatric echocardiographers are going out to obstetricians throughout the Bay Area and educating them about what they ought to be looking for at those routine 20-week ultrasounds so that they can improve the detection rate of congenital heart disease. Because that detection rate, if it's done here at a major center, is about 80%. If it's done out in the community, it's about 20 or 25%, and we're trying to narrow that gap. But is there anything we can do to, to, to actually treat heart disease in utero. And this is an area that is, again, just right on the cusp right now. It's still quite experimental. And actually, one of our own faculty members, Stan Perry, was involved in this when it was developed initially um, in Boston. This is hypoplastic left heart syndrome on a fetal ultrasound. This is an ultrasound done on a fetus at somewhere around 20 weeks, or about halfway through gestation. Here's the right and left atria. Here's the right ventricle. And we're missing something. There should be another chamber here, and it's the, it, here it is. This is the little tiny absent left ventricle, and the right ventricle has grown large to compensate. So by the time we see this, there's really not too much we can do. However, many patients that we see at 20 weeks, but halfway through gestation, what we see is that they've got a narrowing of the aortic valve, but the left ventricle is of relatively normal size. And then if we follow them with ultrasounds every week or two through the pregnancy, what we see is that by the time they're a term, the left ventricle has gotten smaller. We think that normal blood flow into the left side of the heart is an important component of stretching that muscle and sending the right molecular signals to the cells to get the cells to grow. If that doesn't happen because one of these valves is narrowed, then we get this. Now, this is a condition which is moderately easy to treat postnatally. This is a condition which is a much more difficult to treat postnatally and has a much more guarded long-term prognosis. Wouldn't it be great if we could treat this at this stage and prevent this? And that's exactly what Dr. Perry did with a bunch of his colleagues in 2002. The New York Times called it science fiction, um, but it in fact has now been done on, I think, about 100 kids around the country. So I'm gonna walk you through it. This is a, an obstetrical ultrasound. Uh, this is the this is the uterine wall. This is the chest wall of the baby, the fetus, and this is the baby's heart. And that, as you'll see, is a needle. So Dr. Perry is advancing that needle through the uterus, through the mother's abdomen, through the abdominal wall, through the chest wall of the fetus, and into the center of the left ventricle of the fetus. So here we're trying to do an angioplasty. The problem is not the angioplasty, the problem is getting access. And in this case, getting access involves a very complicated procedure. But the angioplasty part, although the baby is very small at this stage, is actually fairly straightforward. Here is now a catheter across the aortic valve. Here's the aortic valve, here's the catheter. And in a minute, you'll see Dr. Perry blowing up the balloon and essentially squishing that aortic valve. There's the catheter, the balloon is blown up now, and that valve is popped open. As I said, this has, in this particular case, the procedure was so successful that not only did the left ventricle grow, but the valve was so well repaired that it did not even need surgery when the baby was born. One of the things that many of our surgeons, including our 
uh, plastic surgeons who are working on uh, repairs of things like cleft lip and cleft palate in utero um, using gene therapy and cell therapy have found is that if you operate on the fetus, amazingly enough, the fetus tends to remodel and repair itself. Uh, the people, uh, Mike Harrison up at UCSF, who first started doing repairs of congenital diaphragmatic hernia, they'd open up the fetus, put a little suture here, and then when the baby was born, there'd be no scar. So during fetal life, cells are capable of doing things that they're not capable of doing during adult life. And when we talk at the end a little bit about stem cell treatment, that's a lot of the aim for uh, people who are looking at trying to program cells to do things that our lazy adult cells can't do. All right? Last bit on prevention. What causes, I don't have a, what, what it says 10 to 4 there. I hope I haven't been talking that long. <laughs> We have a 10 to 8? Okay, good. All right, then we're, we're on relatively good time. And again, if you have questions, I really enjoy the back and forth. Please don't hesitate to stop me. I can talk forever. Uh, another issue, sure. Now, the, the uh, sonogram is two dimensional as far as the surgeon was concerned, right? Yes. So then how does he place the video? Uh, very carefully. <laughs> um, uh, it is two-dimensional, but the people who work in this, most ultrasounds are actually two-dimensional images. Um, and by knowing what structures are in a particular plane, we actually know where we are in the third dimension. So we can actually tell by looking at a two-dimensional view of the heart how far forward or backward we are, because we know that, for example, the mitral valve is in the back and the aortic valve is in the front. If we can see part of the mitral valve, we know we're towards the back of the heart. And there are 20 other clues like that that we use. Um, uh, now, there are some three-dimensional echo systems. I, I took the images out of this because they're, you know, I, I just didn't have enough time. Um, but basically, most of us work in two dimensions, um, at least people who do echo as a, as a routine part of what they do um, are really good at being able to take their, those images and make them into three-dimensional models. That's why I'm not an echocardiographer. I don't, I don't do very well on that. What was the outcome of that first surgery where the father's blood was circulating through the So the outcome was, as many surgeons will say, a success. Um, although um, the baby wound up dying, um, I think at about six or seven weeks afterwards uh, with a pneumonia. Um, so the, you know, the success part was that they proved it could be done. Um, they proved that they could actually get the kid through, but in an era where antibiotics were very primitive um, and breathing machines and ventilators to manage kids, um, the complications built up and that child wound up not surviving. But Lulahai pushed on um, and subsequently did, um, you know, uh, probably I think another 30 or 40 cross circulation uh, procedures. Most of them were successful um, until heart lung machines came about. These days, we very rarely ask families to lay down on the table and, 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 and pretty, but we sometimes do. Uh, Vaughn Starnes, who was one of our surgeons here uh, back in the early 90s, pioneered the uh, use of a, what's called living-related lung, lobar lung transplants. That is taking a lobe of an adult lung and using it to transplant into a child. And in that situation, you are putting both parent and child at risk. And Vaughn used to say it's the only operation you could have a 200% mortality rate from. Um, and you know, seriously, uh, you know, that, that, that is an issue. We, we take liver, you know, pieces of liver uh, from parents and, and put them into, into kids. And the good news is the liver, unlike the heart, can regenerate so the parent doesn't miss it. And if you put a small lobe of a liver into a kid, it grows and gets bigger and is able to take over the function. Uh, people uh, volunteer for giving relatives kidneys all the time. Um, so sometimes we do put two patients at risk in order to solve, to help, to help one, but there's got to be a good reason for it. Other questions? Okay. So, um, you know, Phil alluded to the idea of kind of, can we really understand um, on a cellular level what causes all these problems? Wouldn't it be really great if we could just not have to do any surgery and if we could just basically prevent all this stuff? Well, that's, I think, something that's a bit further away, but I'll tell you where we are. Ten years ago, if you asked me what caused congenital heart disease, I would have said, well, multifactorial. And when you hear a doctor say that, it means we don't have a clue. <laughs> multifactorial 
does mean that there are multiple factors. And in fact, in many diseases, there are environmental effects and genetic effects. But literally 10 years ago, we really didn't have a clue. But we knew that in some conditions, there had to be a genetic effect because the risk of having congenital heart disease, if you have one relative, is a little bit higher. And if you have two relatives, it is even higher than that. Plus, we knew that there were some chromosomal abnormalities, like trisomy 21 or Down syndrome, which are associated with heart disease in about half of the patients. So we knew that genes were important. We just didn't know how to analyze genes back then. Well, then this came along, Human Genome Project. Um, and essentially, uh, using technologies that I don't have time to go over, but which are equally exciting to everything I've talked about today, um, things like gene chips and gene sequencing and TACMAN, we have been able to understand the genome like never before so that we can actually locate specific proteins um, that are made, that are important in the developing heart, and locate them to different locations on the chromosomes. This is a list of currently known genetic causes of congenital heart disease. These are the chromosomal locations, chromosome 22, and these are the genes that we think are involved. But this is a very short list. Um, there are many, many, many congenital heart diseases, um, and this list is a very short one. But this list would have not existed um, 20 years ago and would have been much even shorter uh, 10 years ago. And it's increasing every day. My guess is that within the, if I give this lecture, if I'm still around in 10 years and give that, this lecture again, this list will be so long that it would take me 10 minutes to go through it. And that we will have the genetic causes for many congenital heart diseases. But let's get back to the multifactorial part. This particular condition called Catch-22 or DeGeorge syndrome is due to a big, huge chunk of chromosome 22 uh, uh, missing. In, in those patients. We think we know what gene is involved in that, but again, there's a huge piece of the chromosome missing. But you can take two patients who are missing that same piece of chromosome, and one of them has a totally normal heart, and the other has a very, very abnormal heart. Okay, what's responsible for that? Some of it may be intrauterine environmental differences, um, and some of it may be what we call modifier genes. And that's a, that is making this field a lot more complex than anybody ever believed. It's probably not one gene. It's probably several genes interacting with each other to cause this problem, along with some environmental factors as well. We know, for example, that levels of folate during pregnancy are key and important. Take not enough folate in your diet during pregnancy, you increase the risk of congenital defects. Take too much and you increase the risk of congenital defects. Um, and so this is a field that I think is still fairly young. I'm gonna shift gears now because somebody asked a question about, about stem cells, and I wanna end with a discussion that is totally different than what we've been talking about because we've been talking about structural defects of the heart in kids, but some kids actually have the same kind of heart muscle diseases that adults have. They tend to have them because of either gene defects or virus infections or other things rather than cigarette smoking and too much cholesterol, but they wind up with the same problem, a heart that can't pump, a muscle that's been damaged. The valves are there, they're normal, the, the, um, there's no holes in the walls, but the muscle has been weakened, and that's known as heart failure. Heart failure is one of the leading causes of death and disability in the United States and throughout the Western world. It affects about six million Americans, half of whom are women. Um, Two percent of all adults suffer from heart failure, but that number increases to somewhere about six to ten percent in adults over age 65. The annual costs have estimated to be a minimum of 35 billion dollars and probably quite a bit more, um, and it markedly decreases your quality of life. You can't work, you can't go to school if you're a kid, you can't run around, you can't play. If heart failure is bad enough, you can't even get out of bed. The overall mortality rate in adults at least is about 10%. It's a serious problem. And as I mentioned, it affects women as well as men. Just looking at overall causes of death in the US, um, cardiovascular disease, notice here, responsible for about 33% of deaths in men and about the same in women. So although you women in the audience are somewhat protected because of your hormone status, um, it is still the leading cause of death, much more so than breast cancer, much more so than, than other causes. Um, so it's a serious problem. What can we do about it? Well, you can replace the heart. 
um, and Dr. Shumway spent his life developing the techniques of heart transplantation. When he started that process, he, I don't, many people probably don't know that, that Dr. Shumway actually was not only an MD, but had a PhD. Um, and he did years of experimental work to try to figure out how do you diagnose rejection? How do you do the transplant? What medicines do you need to use? He did the, fir he did the first transplant in the US, and then a bunch of other surgeons just jumped on the bandwagon and said, oh, it looks like an easy operation, let's just do it. And then what happened is in, that, in the first year, almost all those patients died. And the only, and then that led Life Magazine to publish this, um, this report. Um, and unfortunately, they didn't really talk about Norm Shumway in here. They talked about a bunch of other guys. Um, but basically, Shumway soldiered on. He said, we can do it better. And um, this is the pediatric transplant data. It's the data that I like to look at. And it's about the same as an adult, so I think we do a little bit better. And you can see over the eras, this is survival. This is by year. As we go from the 80s to the 90s to the modern era, survival has increased pretty dramatically. This is our survival here in children at Packer Children's. 97% one-year survival, 93% five-year survival after heart transplantation. Um, we don't know where things are going to go getting 10, 15, 20 years out, um, but we have made substantial inroads in solving this problem. So if you look at those six populations, are they identical? Um, not exactly. Actually, the patients we're transplanting today are much sicker and have many other associated conditions than those transplanted in an earlier age. So if you actually risk adjust it, we're doing even better than that um, because we wouldn't have transplanted a lot of the kids um, uh, that we're transplanting today because they're too high risk. The LPCH? With Seal Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford. That's, this is our own data. All right. So, you know, if you have a heart transplant, uh, you probably can't tell looking at these two which is the transplant recipient and which is the sister or brother. Um, but the little guy who's running faster than his sister um, is the one who had the transplant. And just uh, this past December, um, our youngest, in fact, the youngest and longest living surviving patient uh, was featured in People magazine. That's because life has gone out of business now. Um, and here, here's Lizzie in 1984 when Shumway became uh, the, essentially one of the first people to do a heart transplant in a child under three years of age. And here is Lizzie today. And she's a wonderful young woman. She's just celebrated her 25th anniversary of transplant. Uh, she graduated college. She works for Facebook. Um, and she's um, doing more magnificently well. But, you know, transplantation is a big deal. Isn't it? it would be nice if we had something other than that. Well, there are mechanical support systems. And uh, over the years, people have developed a whole number of different artificial hearts. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about them because uh, most of them are used in adults. And that's a real problem for those of us in pediatrics because the number of solutions that will fit into a young child is limited to one. Um, and that's what we call an orphan device uh, for kids. That is, there's something that's useful for adults, but we can't use it in kids either because it's never been tested in kids or it's too big for kids or it has toxicities that are different in kids. And unfortunately, um, most of the companies that make these machines, they see a market which is, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds times larger in adults than in kids. But one company uh, has continued to make a pump for kids. This is a picture of what that looks like. And essentially, because it, kids are small and these pumps are big, it actually doesn't sit inside the body, it sits outside the body. And so essentially, this pump, it looks like a hockey puck, sits on the, on the chest wall. There are two tubes which take the blood in and out of the heart. Um, and um, this is a little child who has uh, uh, just been put on that pump. Bruce Wrights, our uh, former chair of cardiac surgery, who did the patient. <laughs> but you can see afterwards, he's able to wake up and he's able to interact with his dad. Instead of spending the next three or four months on the transplant list waiting for surgery, um, he can be there and interacting with his family. Um, this is a little girl who actually has had her heart transplant after being on such a pump. So these are innovations that are important. But again, we still have to do a transplant. Isn't there another option for patients with heart failure? Well, one of the options that I want to talk about, because it's, it's dear to my heart in the, the work that we do in our lab, is the idea of, of making better drugs or better treatments um, for, for heart failure. And I want to introduce you to the concept uh, we call pharmacogenomics. So 
If I give you a drug, uh, Vioxx as a good example, yeah, most patients who got it, the drug worked pretty well. Um, in a few patients, it didn't really help them. Their arthritis didn't get any better. And in some patients, it caused really significant complications and was taken off the market. Um, so in general, we have tended to blame this all on the drug. Um, Cisapride, a drug that was used for patients with, uh, with stomach reflux and, and acid reflux, um, again, was taken off the market because of this potential complication. Well, was it the drug that's just a bad drug, or was it the interaction between the drug and the patient that is what caused this complication rate? And that's what the whole field of pharmacogenomics is about. So um, I'll give you a hint about what I do. So I study the effect of the, uh, what's called the sympathetic nervous system, the nervous system in our body that gears us up to be able to do exercise and uh, to be able to do all the things that we like to do where we have to call on our heart to work extra hard. Um, and that is modulated by a, a hormone. In this case, that hormone is called adrenaline or medically called epinephrine and norepinephrine. That hormone circulates in our body and how does that hormone affect our heart cells? Well, that hormone binds to a protein that sits on the surface of the heart called the receptor. And it's like a key fitting into a lock. And this particular receptor that binds this hormone is called a beta receptor. Here's a cardiac muscle cell. And when that happens, it increases the amount of calcium in the cell. And calcium is important for making the heartbeat stronger. And so it increases the rate of the heart and also increases the strength of the heart. So if you go out jogging, one of the mechanisms by which your body can supply extra blood flow to your heart in that purpose is that your body is making more of the adrenaline and stimulating those receptors. And this is a system which was developed in ancient times um, uh, because, you know, one day some guy was walking down past his cave and saw a saber-toothed tiger, and, and he realized that he needed to get out of there pretty quickly. And so he basically said, okay, the important thing I want to do is get my heart beat faster. I want to send blood flow to my muscles, but I really don't think I need to eat lunch right now, so I'm going to conserve and constrict the blood vessels going to my intestinal tract, my gut, and that we call the fight or flight response. And that's a perfect adaptation for running away from a saber-toothed tiger or for jogging at 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, but it's a really bad adaptation if it goes on for a long time. And one of the problems when your heart muscle has been damaged is that the muscle sends signals to your sympathetic nervous system that says, mm, I'm not working so well. You need to give me more epinephrine, more adrenaline. And that can cause damage to the cells. In fact, if you take some cells in a Petri dish and I pour some norepinephrine on them, within 30 minutes they're all dead. So it's interesting that the same protein that can make the heartbeat stronger for short bursts of time can actually cause it damage over long periods of time. And that led to the development of a group of drugs which many of you may be familiar with called beta blockers. What a beta blocker is, is it's a false drug that sits in the pocket on this receptor and prevents this from binding and therefore hopefully prevents the damage. Right? Now this is a, a picture of actually what that receptor looks like. This is a 3D molecular structure that uh, Brian Kabilka, one of my colleagues here at Stanford, worked on for at least a dozen years to be able to get this crystallographic structure. You can see that the receptor looks like a bunch of little helices that sit in the membrane of the cell. And that yellow molecule here is the molecule of, of adrenaline that's sitting in the little pocket in that receptor. So if we look at a cartoon of what that looks like, Here's the inside of the cell, the outside of the cell, and those helices wind themselves around seven times through the membrane of the cell, and that's what that looks like if you stretched it out. Why am I showing this to you? Well, it's important. This particular protein has about 500 and something amino acids to it. It's a very, 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 very important protein. It's a class of proteins that's key to everything from vision to taste to all sorts of uh, components of what our body does. Um, in populations, we tend to think of the human genome as saying that basically, well, you know, we're all different than monkeys and zebrafish and worms, but generally humans tend to have pretty much the same genes. And in essence, what we've learned over the last 
five to 10 years is with the techniques that we've now had available through the, the advances in molecular biology, that that's not really true. You can have a single change in one of the nucleotides, one of the coding components of a gene that causes a change in the protein. And um, that sometimes is called a mutation. And other times, it's called a polymorphism, or a single nucleotide polymorphism. What's the difference? A mutation generally causes a disease, sickle cell anemia. Okay, you have a beta globin gene, you have a single mutation uh, from one of the base pairs, from an A to a T, you get a change in the amino acid from glutamate to valine, and instead of the red blood cell looking like this, it looks like that. It doesn't work well, and you have a disease. Cystic fibrosis, another very well-known disease caused by a mutation. However, if the change in the protein doesn't cause a known disease or disorder, and if it's present with a frequency of at least 0.5 or 1% in the population, we call that a polymorphism, which means it's a different form of the gene within a population. How does that affect the patient? Well, it doesn't cause a disease, otherwise we'd probably call it a mutation, but it can affect how you respond to a disease. There is a single nucleotide polymorphism at amino acid number 164, so count from here, 164 down, um, where it's one amino acid, a threonine, in 95% of us. But in 5% of you sitting in this room, it's an isoleucine. It doesn't cause any problems. Everybody's happy to have an isoleucine there, unless you have heart failure. And if you have heart failure, a study by Jerry Dorn and Steve Leggett has shown this is survival. This is days from the beginning of the study. And this shows that if you have damage to your heart muscle and you also happen to have an isoleucine there, your chances of survival are only about half that of somebody who happens to have a threonine there. Turns out that, that there are probably five different polymorphisms in the beta receptors. There are four million polymorphisms in the human genome and we're just beginning to learn about their significance. But one of the things that we've actually learned from the heart failure literature is that these polymorphisms not only affect your response to the disease, they can dramatically affect their response to treatment of the disease. And it turns out there are some beta blockers that work well in patients with one polymorphism and don't work at all in patients with another polymorphism. In general, Within the next five years, it may be that if you have heart failure, you will go in, see your doctor, get a gene test. The gene test will look at certain SNPs, certain polymorphisms in the important genes related to your cardiovascular regulation, and the doctor will say, based on these, I'm going to use these two medicines, but not this one, because I know this one will, in fact, make you worse. We did a, a small study in, 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 in pediatric patients in a collaborative work with four other universities based on this observation, which was that um, Bill Molly, a good colleague of mine, um, had noted that in uh, patients who, uh, children who have heart transplant, if they were African American, their survival was considerably less than if they were ca Caucasian. And he adjusted for socioeconomic factors, and he adjusted for other things. So what's the cause of this? Are we just not treating our black patients as well as our, our white patients? What is responsible for this? So a group of five pediatric transplant centers got together. We got a big grant. And we started looking at the genes that are important to regulating the immune system that would affect survival after transplant. It turns out there's something interesting. There are genes which we call pro-inflammatory cytokines. These are genes that basically help to fight inflammation, have to fight infection. They're the kinds of genes that are great to have high levels of if you're infected. But you, know, you don't really want them working that high if you have an organ transplant. And it turned out that African Americans had a much higher number of the polymorphisms that led them to produce very high levels of a particular cytokine called IL-6. And actually, none of the African Americans had the polymorphism that predicted that they would be low producers. There are also genes that are called regulatory cytokines. These are genes that actually tamp down the activity of the immune system. And you'd want to have a lot of those if you had an organ transplant. 
IL-10 is one example, and it turns out that African Americans were much more frequently low producers of this beneficial IL-10 compared to white non-Hispanics. We've now gone on with this data to show that not only do they have these polymorphisms, but it dramatically affects their survival after organ transplant. So one of the things that we are working on, again, is to do gene panels on our patients prior to transplant so that we know which profile they fit into. Race does not tell us the answer on an individual patient. Let me make that clear. What it tells us is that as a population, this group of people is more likely to have a high producer of this than the low. You still have to look at the individual patient, but you may, in fact, be able to base the treatment. Someone who's a high producer of IL-6, I may want to give them extra immunosuppressant drugs um, to try to prevent rejection. But someone who's a low producer, I actually may be able to reduce those drugs very early on and avoid some of the complications of transplantation. That's the promise of pharmacogenetics. Last thing I'll talk about. Do I still have time? Okay. So six minutes. Good. We'll talk about stem cells. Uh, we have to... In, Everything has to have some stem cell. And I, I don't work directly in stem cells, but we do some really interesting stuff with stem cells. So the ideal for a patient who has, uh, has a, had a heart attack would not be to do a transplant and not to put a mechanical pump in, but to somehow put cells or genes or something back into the heart that would reprogram it and make it into a normal heart again. Unfortunately, heart muscle cells, pretty much when they're damaged and die, they don't reproduce. Now that used to be felt that it was absolute. Now people recognize that there is a small population of cells in the heart that reproduce very, very, very slowly. And people are working to try to get them to speed up a little bit. But one of the ideas was that you could potentially take either bone marrow cells or embryonic stem cells and somehow program them into becoming normal muscle cells and essentially inject them into the heart or inject them into the patient and get normal muscle. Um, and there actually are, oh, probably about 50 or 60 current clinical trials in patients, despite the fact that nobody has shown that these are beneficial in any mammalian species bigger than a mouse. Um, there are clinical trials in patients where they're injecting these things to see whether or not they work. And in some studies, they improve heart function by a very small amount. Nobody has yet used this technique to cure heart failure. But at least they're proving that these cells can hone into the heart and live there. And it's not really clear whether they can become real heart muscle cells. Um, you, you know, obviously, because you're in California, about the, um, uh, the controversy about, about stem cells. You know we have a wonderful uh, center for regenerative medicine and uh, a stem cell uh, program here in, 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 in this state. Um, but there is a new technology, uh, which um, I'll just give you a hint about, that may remove some of the need to go back to embryonic stem cells, and that is induced potential stem cells, that is iPS cells. So it turns out that you can actually isolate cells from an adult from skin or fat. Um, in fact, one of our surgeons, Mike Longacre, goes to liposuction clinics and gets big bags of fat for free. So all the experimental data he can, he's got stuff for years there. And if you use the right genes, you can actually program those cells to become cells that are capable of essentially differentiating or growing into cells of different types. So they started out as skin or fat cells, but you can bring them back to that early embryonic stage where they have the potential to become anything. And then you can, using other stimuli, you can get them to form bone or cartilage or nerve tissue or muscle. Um, and that is an incredible promise for being able to do this kind of repair. But I'll leave you with one other thought, because this goes into work that we're doing. OK, it's great. You tell me I've just had a heart attack. You're going to take some cells from my bone marrow, inject them into my heart muscle. The one question I'm just going to say is, is there any data that those cells are going to become muscle cells? Is there any data that they're actually going to work even though they may look like a muscle cell, a muscle cell has to do more than sit on a Petri dish and look like a muscle cell. It's got to work. It's got to move. It's got to contract. So we got together with uh, Beth Pruitt, who's one of our mechanical engineers, and we asked the question, how is it possible to measure 
the ability of a single cell to generate force. And it turns out she does this in nematodes or worms. And I saw a lecture over here in the Clark Center. And I said afterwards, I, I introduced myself and said, do you think we could do that in a single muscle cell? And for the past three years, we've been working on this. And I'll show you what we have. Here is a piece of a essentially silicon wafer that we can essentially use a photoresist to um, essentially carve it out to have these little tiny posts. Um, these posts are stretchable, and we can measure the force constant of each of these posts, and then we can put a cell on top of there. And as the cell adheres to those posts and as it contracts, it bends those posts. We know from, uh, from, from measurement techniques how much force it takes uh, to bend that post. And this is what that looks like. Here are the little force posts. Here is a muscle cell in its relaxed form. Here is a contracted form. This is an individual muscle cell. And I'll show you a little movie of what that looks like. It's kind of hard to see that. But here's the muscle cell here. And look at that post here. See how that's moving? See how that's moving? Um, we can calculate in nanonewton, nanonewton accuracy, the force generated by one of these muscle cells. And then we can plot that out in a three-dimensional plot. So that we're hoping to be able to now do this with, that was a normal mouse muscle cell. I'm hoping to be able to do that with stem cells. So we can ask the question, OK, great. This is a stem cell, but is it going to work in my heart to help fix the heart? Question. What's the pitch of those pedestals? Um, that's a question that I think, I think there, well, there's a 10 micron marker. So I think we make them in both 5 and 10 micron varieties. And we can actually alter the composition of the substrate so we can change the spring constant. So we can actually vary what's called loading conditions on the muscle cells um, and change how much work that they have to do. Um, because the heart is an organ that does work. It doesn't sit there under a microscope and just contract. It has to actually to do work. OK. So the last stem cell advance that I'll mention, this is the last slide I have, is the use of a biological pacemaker. Now, go back to Dr. Lillehei in that big refrigerator, lugging it down the hall, going back to working with Medtronic and developing that first pacemaker box. When I was in um, college, I worked at a summer camp for kids with heart disease, and we had a young man who had a pacemaker. In those days, it was so big, it kind of stuck out from his chest, and he used to complain that all the teachers at school used to think he was carrying a pack of cigarettes in his pocket um, until they finally learned that, in fact, he, but he was deformed by that large pacemaker. Nowadays, pacemakers are the size of basically a half dollar. But wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to use a pacemaker? Well, uh, a number of different researchers at several different labs have programmed cells to become pacemaker cells. And there we go. There is a normal electrocardiogram generated from a group of cells in culture that looks identical to a patient electrocardiogram. Wouldn't it be great if, in fact, the pacemaker of the future wasn't a device with wires and leads and batteries, but was essentially an injection of a couple of cells into a key location in the heart. And they'd go ahead and start beating on their own. And therefore, your heart block is taken care of. We've gone from that refrigerator to the little pacer box, potentially to a cell therapy. So I'll end, and then we can, I'm going to stay around for any other questions. Um, you know, seeds are really important. Seeds are the seeds of ideas. Um, they grow. They need to be nurtured. Um, that's why a, uh, a medical center and a university like Stanford is such an important place, because it brings together a doctor like me with a clinical question. I have a kid with a hole in their heart. What do I do for this kid to make their life better? Um, it allows me to work with some of the best engineers and the best scientists um, so that we, as a collaborative group, can nurture that seed, make it grow, um, and then hopefully do the best so that our patients um, are well cared for and have a bright future. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm <laughs> glad for any questions you have. Well, I uh, can tell you enjoyed uh, Dr. Bernstein's presentation, and I think this is a 
illustration of a couple of really important things. First, from a rare disease, congenital heart disease, affecting a subset of, pop of patients, children, you can not only learn ways of improving their outcome, but you can generalize that information to really impact uh, the whole variety of uh, adult um, disorders. It begins to define a way of developing personalized medicine and it bridges the gap um, between basic discovery and what we call translational medicine, bringing that from the laboratory to the bedside and back and forth. And the history that you heard tonight is really a great illustration uh, of that. So I want to thank Dr. Bernstein for really a stellar presentation and tell you um, that next week we're going to move from the heart to the brain and we're going to start talking about how we can use interventional approaches to better uncover ways of de dealing with congenital or developmental malformations in the brain, as well as one of the most important effects that occur in adults, and Dr. Bernstein alluded to this as well, which is stroke. Um, so we'll have a neuro a team of neurointerventionalists help us understand that process. So I think that'll be an exciting uh, venue into another system that uh, we hope you'll learn about next time. Uh, let me also tell you that um, the articles that I mentioned to you last week on mammography are now online, um, so you can go to uh, our website and look for that. Uh, we're still working on uploading Dr. Rubin's lecture. It requires a whole new discovery of the internet to load all that uh, data, but we'll get there. Um, and I know that pretty soon we'll be able to announce uh, that iTunes will be capturing all of our first uh, round of lectures so that those of you who uh, weren't able to come in the first uh, quarter, you can listen to those. And those of you who want to go back and uh, check things out again in light of some of this new information, you'll be able to do that as well. So thanks again for coming tonight, and especially thanks, Dr. Bernstein. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.